You're listening to the Black Eagles podcast. Welcome back, everybody. This is episode 238 of the Black Eagles podcast, and I'm your host, Sinan Fording, live from New York City, where the weather has been nuts, a heat wave, things got to a simmering point, and have suddenly cooled down a bit. See how that goes. Um, as for Bechik Tush, of course you can say the same. Things reached a fever pitch going into our final preseason match. Our first mini crisis, right? Spawning from the, the, the absence of Ridvan Yilmaz. Somewhat solved. That's the good. But that was offset, and, and to be honest, we didn't know about any of it. This is that's like the most recent news, but it's offset by the bad, which was some controversy going into our final friendly of the preseason regarding tactics. Was was Valerien Ismail's hand being forced? And then, of course, you hear those sirens go off because you have the good, the bad, and and naturally, what's next is the ugly. And the ugly is, of course, what has occurred. Vis a vis Emirhan Ilkan, the former golden boy turned vile creature. Let's get this thing started so I can explain. Operation is in effect as of right now. That's right. So, if you don't know what I'm talking about, this must be confusing. Um, obviously, where we left off last was. Ridvan Yilmaz having departed. We are going into our final preseason match against Samdoria. Our first at Vodafone Park. We were going to see much of our starting lineup. You know, it was assumed. With some holes, we did not resolve the left wing, or sorry, left wing back, or just left back situation by any stretch but there were a number of names on the list there we had an Iraqi left wing back who's playing in Sweden a young Israeli left back who we were competing with Olympiacos for and a Premier League left wing back with uh, experience at the highest level all intriguing options um, and you know the good news was that obviously we'd compiled the list you know well we knew Ridvan was on his way out and we were just sort of like checking boxes one by one going through it uh, so that, that that was all positive nothing to be down about in that regard <clears throat> and so you had the good right um, and that would come to a final resolution tonight or this morning, very early this morning, whatever, however that shakes out, Arthur Masuaku is going to be a, be- uh, a Besiktas player. He is, yeah, but he's going to be in Istanbul, more specifically than that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's an intriguing move for us. He's 28. He'll be turning 29 in November. Uh, we're buying him with uh, a loan plus uh, buyout option, as we tend to. We're not buying him per se. We're we're, we're loaning him, uh, but p- potentially buying him, and we'll see how that shakes out. It might be a uh, you know an obligation to buy rather than an option. We'll we'll see more info coming. We'll also see if perhaps we can get a 
Arthur Masuaku episode with Khan Bayaz. Uh, although I don't want to presume anything. The man is busy. Uh, but that could be nice, no doubt, for us to be informed a little bit more as far as who this fella is. He is potentially solving a huge issue for us. Um, what I can say sort of superficially about his profile uh, first of all, he's Congolese, another Congolese left back, which for folks who remember Nsakala might be like, uh oh, but uh, I mean, he's obviously played at a much higher level, having played for quite a few years at West Ham, actually. He joined them in 2016, playing six years there, 105 appearances, so that's significant. He featured for the French under-18 and under-19 national sides before switching over to Congo in 2018. He's only made 11 appearances for the Congolese national side. I know Nsakala has made quite a few more, so I don't know if uh, it's a product of him switching over more recently. Clearly, he's the more higher-profile player, <clears throat> so who knows you know, what the logic is there. But so yeah, Arthur Masuaku uh, should be a good player. I can't see why he wouldn't be. We certainly have a need at that position. Um, so, uh, what One intriguing thing about him is that he's... So again, I say superficially, but he is m much more of a left wing back than left back. Which gives us, I think, a good pairing, right? If Valerie Ismail prefers the four-man back line, you'd have Umut Medash, who could potentially play that left-back, more defensive left-back role, which is where he fits in much better, right? He struggled in the left-wing-back role, uh, specifically with the attacking, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Responsibilities, I suppose, right? But so Masuaku is much more of a attacking-minded wing-back so, on the three-man back line, he fits much more than Umut Medash did. And of course, I've spoken at length in the, in the previous episode, specifically, about how Umut Medash is apparently not the man to play left wing back. Unfortunately, actually, because I had hoped he might adapt to it, right? But, you know, he's only 25 or 26, right? But, uh, you know, apparently that, that wasn't happening. But so, speaking of the four-man back line and why he might still have a role, and for folks who are like, yeah, but he's been taken out of the squad, I do believe that he has a mild injury. So I don't think he's been taken out because of his poor performance in the preseason, which would be like the fear, I suppose, right? No, but that, that is not the case, as far as I'm aware. Um, he has suffered some sort of minor injury, but so he will still be in the squad. And that's important, because... We will potentially be playing with a four-man back line on occasion. And the reason we perhaps now know that is that going into this last match, right? So we might we start with the good, which is Arthur Masuaku. Move to the bad, which is a kind of a, our, our, <clears throat> our mood on Friday morning. And I won't even talk about the ugly. Because that I'm gonna save that for last. I'm gonna need to rant on that. <laughs> I'm gonna really need to rant. The bad, however, and it wasn't the match against Samdori, it was this sort of news going into it, which is that Valerian Ismail was being forced, we thought, theoretically, to, to, to play uh, a four-man back line and revert to the three central midfielder sort of uh, setup that we're all very familiar with. There was no distinguished defensive midfielder in the trio that was out there. Um, and we'll get into that, but you know, I guess I can spoil there with Sali, Uchan, Jedson, and Kartal Kaira Yomas, which is an interesting move. Uh, between those three, there was no it's like there's no one that stands out as a defensive m midfield midfielder, right? I mean, Joseph still sort of solves a problem when you're playing with that three midfield role there, uh, that th th formation rather, and you know. When he does switch to that four-man back line, you'd imagine Joseph has a much more clear role. He knows what he's doing. That's his That's his role, specifically. But, you know, with 
Masuaku. Maybe now you, you see that variability where we'll switch between the two. And in this match, you'd see a little bit of that as well. And what's, what's even more important, I think, is that even with the <clears throat> four-man back line, the sort of key function of his, and by his I mean Valeria Ismail's uh, understanding of football, his tactics, his logic, is to have this shifting line. And of course, we've seen Valer, uh, Valer, uh, Valentin Rosier uh, interchange with Rashid Ghazal when, when they're both at their best. Uh, and so that's kind of an example of the type of football that Ismail has been sort of preaching. So even with the four-man back line, I think you could expect to see some of that and some uh, fluid lines, to, so to speak. But so, yeah. I guess like let's let's dig in, right? We know we know what the good, the bad, and the ugly are. That's been introduced thoroughly. We know what the good it was generally, and I think we're we're just about done with that. Masuaku, welcome. Uh, the bad. So yeah, as I said already, Ismail's hand was potentially forced, but you know, even if uh, hopefully it's not just from fans complaining. Um, some folks were saying that like players on the squad were, were potentially complaining about the formation where that might make sense is like guys wanting to play on the wings especially like Rashid Ghazal he did not thrive behind two forwards he struggled in that role quite a bit and he is at his best on, on the right side interchanging like I said with Rosier so you know again you, that doesn't necessitate a four-man back line. He could play the 3-4-3, three, three, which was what I thought we were basically going for. And so, like, I guess the real news in that regard is, like, Philippe Kenny, that transfer was potentially nixed, taken off the books. Uh, Nkudu is staying, sort of, officially. It never really was confirmed that he was leaving, and he was included in squads and stuff, even at the height of that rumor. So, perhaps that was unsubstantiated to begin with, but... It certainly seems like we're sticking with the kind of wing options now, and so Nkudu has a role, and they're, they're going to stick with him for now. But so, uh, yeah, let's 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 see what we have in this lineup. Ericsson Destanolo, of course, in the goal. Wellington and Romain Saiz on the back line, with Valentin Jose on the right side, and... Right, like I mentioned, Umut Medash minor injury, uh, Masuaku not on the side yet, not even uh, purchased yet. We didn't know who was going to be the, the real option out there long term. So who we got was Ozan Akun, which I don't know, man. The kid has something. Like at the very least, he's got the drive to 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 compete and play at a high enough level that one knows he wants to be out there. And credit to him for that. He's uh, he's almost too old to be considered a real prospect. Uh, he's only 21 in his defense, but you know he's been a kind of quote-unquote prospect for a few years. But so this is about the time where he'd really want to be establishing himself as something of a of a, a regular fixture with the side to some extent, even just rotationally for depth, whatever that may be. But yeah, so for him being versatile enough to go from striker to left wing back uh, it, beyond just his desire to play which that's a big plus obviously uh, his ability right he, he, it's not like he made a, a fool of himself out there by any stretch I mean credit to Valerian Ismail with his creativity in that regard uh, he did the same thing with Kanan Karma he seems to be finding roles for guys that are struggling in the roles they're supposed to be not struggling in although credit to Ozan Akun as well he played as a striker in one of our first friendlies, I think it was the first one, and he scored a goal as a striker, you know, on a, on a nice cross from Emirhan Delibash, the only Emirhan, in fact, that we have and care about. We'll go into that again later. But so yeah, that was our back line. Ozan Akun being the, you know the standout there, the big surprise. Montero still injured, by the way. In the midfield, I already spoiled this part, but we had uh, Jedson Fernandez in the middle. And Sally Uchan to his right, with Kartal Kaida Yilmaz to his left. And it wasn't entirely clear who was doing what in what role, to be honest. This was 
not a weakness for the side as a as a as a unit because Jedson had a fantastic game. Sali Uchan, you know, kind of took his foot off the gas perhaps a little bit. There's much less pressure on him now, perhaps and we'll get into that again later. Um <laughs> He looks pretty much inked in, uh, uh, certainly at least until Joseph comes back. And that will uh, add uh, another dynamism to that unit as well. And then of course there's Kartal Kaida Yilmaz. You might be thinking, is he next in the pecking order? Shouldn't it have been he who shall not be named? And the reason it wasn't is obviously because that dude is out of here. <laughs> he seems poised to leave. He's gone. Let's just be real about it. He's out of here. Um, but again, I'll, I'll go into that more. I've I've had the roller coaster of emotion, roller coaster of emotions, excuse me, uh, on on that already. Being angry at the board, and then at the kid himself. Now somewhere between the two, they all. I mean, everyone deserves a bit of it. <clears throat> we'll talk about that later. Keep saying that. Keep starting to talk about it. Yeah. Well, I think you all understand. We're all feeling it. And in fact, this was absolutely hovering over the match. It was hard, actually. Like, this was supposed to be a celebratory experience. Our first, again, first match at Vodafone Park of the season. All the new guys getting to experience what it felt like to, be, to play in front of our fans. We'd supposedly sold out. In fact, uh, we did sell out all of the sort of non-season ticket holder seats. Folks who didn't show up, however, were folks who were mostly season ticket holders. So it didn't look like we filled it out much. Uh, still, you know, we made some money on it, obviously. And there was enough of an atmosphere that I think the, the new guys got to experience something. But unfortunately, with that said, this, this Emir Han thing was hanging us, hanging over us like a dark cloud. Uh, at least us fans, and certainly like management, and maybe the coaching staff if not the players, and if not all the players, certainly a lot of the younger ones who would maybe come up with Emir Han might be surprised and shocked by everything going on. <sighs> anyway, in the front line, of course, Veghorst in the middle with Rashid Gazal on the right side and Jackson Muleka on the left. Let's dive in, shall we? Let's talk about what happened out there. So. I'm going to try to do an actual sort of match summary this time. Right lately I've not been doing that with the friendlies, but with this being our final one, sort of practicing for the regular season, right? We're going to be starting up soon. So, let's dive in. Uh, important to note, by the way, Kartal Kaida Yuma has got number six. So he's, he's taking a real number with the squad. He's getting a real role with it, it looks like. Um, he's getting the position that we'd all sort of envisioned Emirhan Ilkan getting. And good luck to him. You know, he's a guy who's shown a lot of promise as well. He may thrive as well. Right? We're, we're producing a lot of talented youngsters these days. And maybe someone out there will pass Emirhan long term, especially due to the decision he made. Which, as I keep saying, I will talk about later. <sighs> but that's how it was, really, right? Everything we were watching in this match was sort of weighed down by the the main fact here which was that we knew what was going on anyway 10th minute uh, the first real action of the match a diving save made by Ersin Caputo for them the shot on target across the bounce of the goal Ersin getting down doing quite well to keep it out of the goal didn't quite get a, a really great punch on it but luckily where he punched it there wasn't anyone of theirs to get onto it and we were still in it nil nil and good because we would take the reins from pretty much there. 13th minute corner kick from Rashid Gizal would drop to Weg Veghorst. He would, I think, maybe try to cross it in, but it would bounce right back to him, and then he would take a shot, and he would sky it. Uh, but again, showing intent. Great to see Veghorst getting involved a little bit here. And that four-man back line is showing some evidence of success already, right? We're getting chances, which was a big problem in the match prior, no doubt, against the Wolves. The Wolverhampton Wolves. So, um, 18th minute, <clears throat> Sally Uchan pressing, and this was what 
we came out really well in this regard. And then what was actually great was that we built up again in the second half. Uh, and so I think our fitness levels are up high enough that when other teams start to flag and get tired, we can kind of bump it up a notch still and uh, really take the game, which should be very useful, certainly in the Super League. But it proved so in this match as well against Sampdoria. Um, Sully, so he's, he presses well, gets the ball off of the defender on, on a short pass from the keeper, uh, sends it, takes it in, and pretty much is, is sort of gifts himself with a one-on-one -on -one opportunity, and then takes a pretty poor shot, sending it um, sort of high and just, just high and wide. I think maybe even hit the side netting. Uh, and it's too bad he could have, should have forced the keeper into having to do something there. But, alas, good to see the effort, good to see the, the shift in our mentality here. 31st minute, a free kick by Rashid Gazal finds the head of Roman Saiz, who heads it down perfectly and just wide. So it was a free kick from pretty deep, perfectly placed as he does it, Monsieur or Monsieur Gazal. But, alas. Roman Saiz is not lucky enough to get his first goal in, in the Besiktas kit. But you can see something maybe happening there. He clearly has that ability. No doubt about that. <clears throat> so, we come, we move things along. At this point, we've taken the match, it would seem. And sure enough, the 36th minute. I don't even know, honestly. Like, uh, Jedson has the ball. <clears throat> He's passed it from the defense into the midfield. He's pressed from behind. Looks like a foul by Kali. Kali um, sort of instead nicks it off and passes it into the path of Sabiri, number 11. Just past the halfway mark on the pitch, half uh, the midfield, and he just launches a ball from there over the head of Ersin Destanolu and into the back of the net where Ersin's racing back, can't get there fast enough. And Sabiri has like a Pushkas award-winning goal for Interfriendly. Uh, and I didn't see um, Sports Center that night, but I wouldn't be surprised if it would have wouldn't have made it. Quite a shame for us to go down like that. Because you're never gonna like that's like a you, once a decade you're gonna see a goal scored like that against your side. Uh, that does not happen a lot. And so it's, in, a, in a way it's a shame that, the, that that would change how the match was reflected and how we were gonna have to play and everything. Because we really Looks pretty good for the most part. And that'll be it for the first half. Uh, no subs made, so we we're, you know, kind of trying to see fitness level. Give it, give it the, 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 everyone the trial run here, the full run. And like I said, what was promising here is despite that fact, people were upping their tempo and pressing harder sort of right out of the gates in the second half and most of the way through it and obviously as subs started to come on that became easier but still you could tell that fitness levels were high enough with those guys who played the way the entire first half but they had another level that the op our opposition did not and immediately you could see the benefit um, the first real action in the 53rd minute Valentin Rosier um, off some nice midfield interchange between Jedson and I can't remember if it was Sali or Kartal Kaida Yilmaz, but either way, uh, nice sort of quick passing into the path of Valentin Lozier, who's rushing in from the right side. And like I said, shifting lines, right? You know, you don't necessarily need to be playing with three men back to be able to do that. And it's good to see Valerian Ismail's methodology sort of carrying through despite the, the change in formation and tactics but yeah uh, Rosie with a lovely shot from deep just wide a lot of power on it pretty great placement too just barely missed and you can see right away that the intent is real um, and so then we get a couple sub 59th minute Berkai Vardar on for Roman Seiss Emre Can Uzunhan on for Kartal Kaida Yilmaz so for anyone paying attention, that's two central defenders on, one central defender off, and one central midfielder off. <clears throat> and you could make the argument that Berkai Vardar is maybe more of like a defensive midfielder type, but still he's functioning as a third defender and allowing 
even more variability and flexibility if that is the case. But I'm pretty sure we're switched to a back three at this point. Um, also in the 59th minute, Nkuru coming on for Muleka. So we've committed to him being in the squad, it looks like now. We're, we've committed to the, the idea that we're playing with wingers. And so he clearly has a role, and it doesn't look like he's going anywhere. And yeah, he, he made an impact. I mean, as he tends to do. I honestly think he could be valuable as a sub in this regard. Uh, and there's a lot of value for us to, in terms of keeping him. I didn't see any sense in us letting him go, since any winger we're getting in is for depth anyway at this point, right? We know Gazal and Jackson Muleka are going to be starting. So really, like, I think Ugudu is kind of the perfect super sub, as long as it can stay healthy. And we have depth, right? There's 14. Like, one nice thing about the, the moves of the guys we have, like with Boyd and Hasich, who... Well, he's been made Kadro DC, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, but, you know, we do have options, like, even as a third, like, should Nkuru be injured for some stretch or, or whatever. But hopefully that's not the case. And Anyway, moving along briskly. Right after those subs are made and we switch to the three-man back line, bang, we score. And, like, we're pressing at this point even more impressively. And just three subs made. But... Yeah, I mean, that three-man back line seems to have added to that effect to some extent. And it pays off almost immediately in the 64th minute, a goal by Veghorst. Uh, it is, in fact, Jedson who's pressing, like I said, we're pressing all over with high energy, showing that extra level of fitness. And bam, he presses. Uh, again, it's the keeper passing out of the box. We don't. Jedson doesn't actually get the ball, but he pressures it enough that it kind of trickles out to Veghorst, who dribbles like a couple steps to his left and slots it in perfectly into the net, side netting, or maybe just the back netting, but, you know, um, with some power and a little curve and placement on it into the side of the goal, beyond the keeper's reach, and you love to see it. Yellow cards in 67th minute for Veghorst and Kali. No comment, honestly, I don't really care. Subs for them in the 68th minute. Four subs, actually. Um, and in the 70th minute, Emirhan Ilkhan would enter for Sali Uchan. Emre Bilgen on for Ersin Destanolu. Cenk Tosun on for Vaut Veghorst. And in the 73rd minute, it's Jedson into the path of Nkudu. Nkudu with a nice run along the left side, cuts it in, takes a shot. A little curvy and high and wide. Doesn't quite sky it, right? It's close enough. Kind of might, might even nick the uh, top of the post, but uh, not great placement there. But again, showing the, the value of a super sub, you know, especially with this pressing style we're playing, his pace you know, can really add something, you know, if we, if we get a quick counter because of that. Just huck it up to the left side, you know, and Kudu can get there, right? Um, but so, yeah, that would be the last real chance that I could recall. Um, three more subs made by Sam Dori in the 85th minute. Tyler Boyd entering for Jedson Fernandes. Emir Han Dalibash for Rashid Gazal. Nejip on for Wellington. Uh, they would make a couple more subs as well, but I mean, that, that would be it. That would be it. A good day. All in all, for us, we had 56% of the ball there, 44%. 396 passes completed to the 329 at an 84% rate, they're 78. So, I mean, they're a good side. Uh, Serie A side, they played well in this regard. Their passing was very efficient. Um, but still, we held the ball much of it. But not like in a way that's like, you know, we used to have like 70% of the ball, but like almost do nothing with it. In this case, this is important. We had 19 shots. They only had four. Unfortunately, only two were on target. They they had three on target, which is weird. But like, there were so many things that just went just wide. Like I, I mentioned, four or five highlights of, of that nature. Um, it wasn't because the chances weren't fantastic. Sali Uchan just kind of fluffing a chance early. Rosier skittering one just wide, but like really well placed, really powerful. Um, Roman Sais' header, you know, all of these were fantastic chances. Um, they committed 18 fouls to our 17, which is, I thought that was unfair. They, they, they played a very physical brand intentionally. 
so it's weird to me that we got flagged almost equally in that regard. But Turkish ref, I think he was trying to make them. Uh, they're overcompensating, I think, and given that it was a friendly and all that. Obviously, in a real competitive match, you wouldn't get a Turkish or Italian ref, and that's why you know you don't want them feeling like they have to to do that to prove that they're not biased or whatever it is. But so yeah, one yellow card apiece. We had six corners to their three, I guess. You know, to show a little bit of that intent. But yeah, that, that's it. That's all I really have to say for that match. As far as like the man of the match goes, I don't know. You, you could make an argument for Rashid Ghazal. He was back, which was great to see, playing very well. Um, Valentin Ozier, who's quietly put away a very nice preseason. Um, doing his job throughout well, even under the radar because everyone's focused on all the sort of problems. Oh, what are we having on the left side? Or, you know, oh, are we playing with wings? Or are we playing with... Where she gets all behind two forwards. Uh, you know, amid all, amidst all that chaos. Are we playing... Who's starting in the center oh, with Joseph out? Right for two and a half months. Well, so that's essentially resolved. Uh, we're going to play with wings. We're going to play either with three men back or four men back uh, with some variability. I mean, and in the reality of playing the three-man back system that we were playing is that oftentimes it would be kind of a four-man line with one of the fullbacks or wingbacks staying back and while well, the other one went up and then kind of adjusting positionally so that it looked like a four I mean that was that's the nice part about whatever it is he's doing is that flexibility that variability so um, yeah credit to the team looking good playing well obviously we would have won if not for a weird fluke goal but we can live with it. All in all, you know, an interesting preseason. One that was certainly very heated, um, controversial in a lot of ways, but maybe too much so, right? Two wins, two draws, two losses. We've seen much worse and result in quite good seasons. We've seen fantastic preseasons result in terrible seasons, regular seasons. So we won't put too much stock in it. Uh, we still haven't seen our proper starting 11 yet, unfortunately, if we're going to be 100% honest, right? We haven't even, we, we, we've only just got our left wing back for starters, right, with Ridvan out. But even beyond that, right, Seiss finally getting to play a full match in this last one. And not a full match, right? I mean, he came out, but you know what I'm saying? Um... Montero's been out. There's that, that question of he, whether he or... Wellington will start is, is a whole thing. You know, with the three-man back line, you typically want to have like a right-footed guy on the right side and a left-footed guy on the left side. With the two-man back line, I think it's much more of a crapshoot. It doesn't really matter that much. You know, most of our lives, we've seen two right-footed central defenders, right? So if they're both left-footed or one of them is right-footed, one of them, it's not that important. The key is that one of them is, is at least one of them is good enough on the ball to, to pass it well enough to get it out of the defensive zone uh, without just having to hock it up every time, right? But we have a, n a number of central defenders who are capable of that. But so yeah, to recap, right, we started out the preseason with a win against Werder Bremen. We drew Victoria Pilsen, despite a very dominant performance. We beat Mines once in the other, and perhaps the highlight of the preseason, a dominant performance with the three-man back line. Then we lost to Wolves and Deportivo Alaves. Um... Especially Alaves, that was like our, our youth side that kind of gave it up. We were ahead, you know, bending but not breaking for much of the first half. Uh, but so, you know, and then we ended with the one-to-one -one draw against Sampdoria. We got our feet underneath us, right? We, the fitness levels, you could really see them starting to pay off by the end of the preseason. So, mission accomplished. Let's hope it all translates into a great regular season. First match of the season, by the way, Saturday, August 6th, four days from right now, the day of release, the day of recording, because I'm doing it after midnight. Uh, and so, yeah, we're going to be hosting Kai City Spore, 2.45 p.m. here, local time, Eastern Standard, right, in, from New York City. Check your local listings. That's obviously not what time it's going to be on in Turkey. It'll be like 9.45, I believe, but... Um, check your check your local listings and PM of course. But so yeah, I'm I'm so thrilled that the regular season's here and we can stop talking about all these weird controversies and we can start focusing on regular old football. 
And so, before we can even do that, though, sadly, we have to have a real conversation about the final kind of crisis of the preseason. Unless you count re-signing Ersin Destanolu, which we absolutely must do, by the way. Um, but so, yeah, let's dig in to the, to the Emir Khan Ilkhan conversation. And it's just me. I don't have any guests. Um, I want to have a bit of a rant. I really... I didn't want to get someone else to say anything like I want this is coming from the bottom of my heart folks much like a child whose parents are divorcing <laughs> initially you don't know who to blame what to blame right like someone chased off someone else and you you're angry you know, irrationally at that person. Why, why, why is why is dad or mom, why are they leaving? This is your fault. You like tell them to come back. Why are you, why are you always yelling? Like surely it's, you know, there's something we can still do, right? There's a sort of negotiation phase. And then finally you kind of come to the realization, wow, like that person left. And it's oftentimes their fault for doing so, right? And like, so you, you know, you, you, you shift your focus to the real problem who did what to hurt your, you uh, and to make the general situation worse. And generally, that focus shifts to someone else. And the reason I talk about something as dramatic as like divorce or like when two friends break up, right? If you have a couple in your group of friends and they break up, right? And, and things shake out awkwardly, right? Like there's always that kind of, oh, whose fault is it? And initially you think it's someone and then you kind of realize big picture that and the reason this is so significant is because this has happened, right? Emir, Emir Han Yilkan has left. It's not official, official, but it's, it's, it's official. That's Murat Uzen has said that it's happening. Sarjan Dikme has said that it's probably happening. <clears throat> Four and a half million euros, 15%. You know, uh, we collect 15% of the profit of his next sale. Wh I mean, wow, right? Shocking. How could this happen, right? He just literally got number 17. He just re-signed. It was one of the W's of, the, of our offseason, him and Emre Bilgen re-signing. I hope Emre Bilgen doesn't have any crazy clauses. And so here's what's up, right? Like, first of all, the reason I was so pissed at our club and the board, and it stands to some extent. How can you allow this? How could you let this clause be in there, right? And here's the only rationale I can come up with in their defense. But in, in retrospect, it's fairly compelling. And here's what it is. They're thinking, okay, we've re-signed him in this window. The window's going to close, right? so far in the future. So they're already thinking of this as essentially a closed window, right? The season's starting on Saturday, etc., etc. So they've resigned him. And, and in the clause, they're like, oh, you know, if he doesn't play 1,100 minutes, or something like that, 1,150, or I, don't, I don't remember what the exact number was, then someone is allowed to swoop in and buy him for four and a half million. And they're thinking, okay, fine, the window closes, we're going to have until January for him to get 1100 minutes, which is like essentially 12 matches of playing time. That's not a concern. After that, after that sort of minimal level was reached, then I think the, the minimum buyout release clause goes to like 8 million euro, for example, right? So you're thinking we're going to get at least 8 million for this kid who's only turning 18. There's no guarantee that he pans out with our club. 8 million is a decent return. I'd argue it's you're still underselling. You should be going for 10, maybe 12. I think he was a very bright talent, bright prospect. I mean, we're all devastated. Let's be real. We had him pegged in as a starter with Joseph Fass. Not Kaida, Kartal Kaida Yamaz. Not even Sally Uchan. To say he was going to compete with Sally Uchan for that spot, eh, not really. It was his. He had it. He was essentially the incumbent, right? He played the majority, as far as anyone on the squad that was there from last season, but it's either between him and Atiba. Uh, and given just that he came on way later in the season, I think it was it was Emirhan's spot to lose. So he was pegged in as a starter for his club. 
having just turned 18. I think Besiktas, right, the board, in allowing that clause, they've essentially written off the notion that he's going to leave in this transfer window, right? First of all, who's coming in? Who knows about this clause? A. B. Season's about to start. There's not much of this window left. C. Even if some cl club found out about it and was like, oh, let's, let's swoop in and offer the four and a half mil, Amir Khan would have to sign off on it, right? And like, why would Amir Khan leave a starting role with the club that raised him? He's just gotten a pay raise. Right? Like, I, I think it goes beyond reason. Like, I, they didn't even sort of anticipate the, lo the, the notion that it was possible for him to leave. Even just down to the logic of, like, why would he... Why would he do us dirty like that, right? We've just re-signed the kid. In fact, we've given him assurances that if a big club comes in for him, I mean, we'll get eight million. I mean, think about Ridvan, uh, Ersin, like everyone who has the potential of leaving has talked about their desire to make this club money. Jink, Toshin, so many guys who don't even have, who weren't even here as an academy player and, and raised by the club and invested in for all those years and all of that. You know, the brother at arms, right? The the, the bond, band of brothers that tends to be these classes of youth players that come up together. Even beyond all that. Right? I mean, your academy players are supposed to be the most loyal when they come up because you they've been with the club since, what, 13, 14? So, Emir Han's agent, it turns out, has dealings with a Serbian coach who's in very close contact with the manager of Torino in Italy. And so he has him training apparently. He had Emirhan training in Serbia all summer. Apparently under the watchful eye of this same coach with the sort of affiliations to Torino. So that's how they, they knew about this. That's why they smoothed in. And Emir Khan agrees to screw us over completely. He could have just waited till January. He could have gotten a ton of valuable playing time and made us about twice as much as we got. Not only would the minimum release clause go up to eight million after those 1100 minutes, the percentage of the next profit transfer would have gone up from 15 to 20 percent. So, he screwed us over. Try not to curse. I mean, that's minimal, right? But I, I'm trying, I was, my instinct is use the F word. This kid's a snake. <clears throat> I don't really know how else to say it. I mean, everyone's like, oh, what can you expect, right? Like, turkeys in disarray and blah, 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 right? Like, who doesn't want to jump for the opportunity to play in a top five league and he'll have a better chance of developing? I mean, A, that's debatable. Well, let me explain why. But first of all, Torino is a mid-table side in Serie A. Potentially a relegation threat. I mean, I don't know if that's true. They could be though, right? They're certainly not challenging for the title there. They're not, they're not trying to win the Scudetto. Um, So that's that. They're not really a much higher profile club than Besiktas as it is. They're gonna get thumped more than not. Which means it's not like there's gonna be a high, like a, a, a giant spotlight shown on the kid because he's playing there rather than at Besiktas. Quite the opposite, in fact. Especially given the fact that he had a starting role with Besiktas. He developed a line of credit, by which I mean he makes a couple mistakes here and there. It doesn't matter. We know his quality. He's gonna play regardless. He's gonna maintain his role. He's gonna keep it. We're gonna be very okay with a couple mistakes. We know he's 18, but we also know he's a very bright prospect. We know, we know, we know. We've seen enough. We trust the kid. He's earned it, right? By playing quite well as a 17 year old. So we're not gonna bump him out of that role if he makes a couple mistakes. Torino, they don't know the kid. They've spent minimal money. He could be a total flop. It matters very little. They've wasted so little money on this kid, especially relative for them. It doesn't matter if he doesn't pan out. It's just a $4 million bust, 
or it doesn't even count as a bust because it's so little. And frankly, like he's an 18 year old, he could be moved down to the reserves. He can make a couple mistakes here and there. They say, oh, he's not ready yet. They loan him out to someone in Seti Bay or, or back to Turkey maybe. Uh, which doesn't benefit anyone. It wouldn't benefit us to bring him back on loan. It's not like we're gonna develop him for us long term. All we're gonna get is 15% of that next sale, which won't amount to the amount of money that's been robbed from us in this exchange. So yeah, do I excuse the board? No, I mean, you, you never, when you're doing business with anyone, just sort of assume, oh, like there's no like family contract where you, you, you pay a little less attention to the fine print, where you, where you don't really mind, oh, that clause over there, which I mean, it's no, there's no way you'd screw us over like in the three weeks that are left before he couldn't. Maybe he will, right? You always assume that there's a bad actor on the other end, just in case this is why. You shouldn't have to, right? He should theoretically be family. <laughs> right? It doesn't make sense why he would screw us over to the extent that he has. You shouldn't, you'd never expect him to, but it doesn't matter. When you're doing business, you just, business is business, right? So that is a fundamental error, flaw, a huge mistake. But with that said, turns out, Amirhan made this claim himself now. He's put it out there as his public statement. He demanded that clause be inserted in there, his agent, rather. He said, if I'm resigning, taking this pay, if I'm taking this pay raise, then I in insist on these clauses being inserted because uh, my ambitions are abroad in Europe. And again, the assumption is fine. Like, you know, you can't hold that against the kid. Just do your best while you're here. Let's get you to as high profile of plays as you can. And let's be real. He doesn't have to go in January either. If he plays a full season with the role that we had for him, he'll have his pick of top five leagues to go to. You know, maybe, maybe not like Man City or something, right? But like, there will be teams, not just in the middle of the table, but like towards the higher end. Teams going to the to, to Europa League conference, the conference league to, to maybe even the Champions League. I mean, maybe, probably not, but maybe France. I don't, I don't know who like the third team in France that goes, right? It's like Lille or something, right? I mean, but I mean, the point being right there, there there's a sort of a certain profile of club that as soon as he has a full season under his belt, as an 18 year old, turning 19, showing the sort of level of quality that he showed last season, bam, like guaranteed, they're, they're gonna pay, you know, we could reject, he, he could agree not to take that eight million bid knowing confident that they'll pay more than that. I mean, and fine, we, we'd still, whatever, we'd still sell them for the eight, we'd, we'd, we'd submit to the, to the minimum release clause, but, at least it's twice as much. At least there's a higher percentage cut on the next sale. These things matter to a club like ours that's massively in debt. But so, that's how it ends. Four and a half million. We got uh, six and a quarter million from the Ridvan deal. So that's ten and three quarters of a million that we've gotten back. We've spent like 16. It's not a bad window in that regard, and we've cut wages significantly, cut a ton of dead weight with all the old contracts finally let go of Sakala and the like. But this, this hurt. And not only does it hurt us in that sense that like we've been backstabbed by one of our own, so irrationally, right? It's so hard to wrap your head around why he'd do it. It doesn't even benefit him, right? Like I said, like he could be the next Sally Uchan who goes to Italy much lower profile squad than Sally Uchan went to, which could theoretically mean he has a more significant role, but again, he's, he's 18, right? Like, why would he? Uh, but he could just go there, get benched, get loaned out to a bunch of crappy other teams, and then come back to Turkey with his tail between his legs when he's like 24, and have to sort of resuscitate his career via Lanya Sport, like Sally Uchan did, or whoever the equivalent is, and you know. 2027 or whatever it might be. So I think he's taken a, a, an incredible risk. And people are like, oh, well, he's buying it. He's, he's you know, putting his money where his mouth is. He's buying into himself. Yeah, I guess. On the other hand, like, I don't think taking a starting role with the club that you came up with 
and putting a solid season under your belt. It's not like he's going to get like Champions League football or something, right? Yeah. I don't know. I've really come to a point where I think I, I resent him more than the board by a lot. It's a selfish decision. Poorly thought out. Ill-advised. Rushed. And it's not going to benefit the kid. Probably. It could, right? Let's hope for the best. I, I guess, if you want to. I don't even know why we, why we should. I don't even care. I guess it was like a Turkish national team maybe down the line, right? But it's not going to really benefit us much, and I, I mean, I, I, I'm resentful enough of, of how he did this at this point that I, I don't want to say I don't want him to succeed, honestly. That seems so spiteful. It's beneath us to do that, but I mean, I don't know, man. Like, this was such a snake maneuver. I, I, I still don't get it. It's, it. It hurts. It hurts. And what's worse, too, is now we, uh, you know, like I said, we're four days away from the season. We've now switched to a system potentially where we need three central midfielders. And we, we're we lacking guys. We need depth. We went from a position of strength where we had Jedson and Emir Han and Joseph and Atiba. I'm sure maybe Kartok had a Sally Uchan, right? Whatever. Now Sally Uchan is like guaranteed to be a starter because basically after that it's Kartok had a Yuma. Joseph's out, right? I mean, and he'll be back in October, hopefully. But um, until then, yeah, we're probably gonna have to go on to go go find someone anyway, just to fill out this, fill out the depth, regardless of the fact that we can hopefully count on Joseph to come back. But he puts us in a position, right? Going into season, now we have another hole. We we just we we were just put in a our first sort of mini crisis, and it was. You know, people were freaking out because we needed a left back and like, oh, well, like left wing, but wing backs are so hard to come by. We have to change the whole system. Everything has to has to change. We need to go back to the four man back line. It's like panic mode, right? Scrambled. We've got someone. Maybe he's good, Masuaku. I hope he is. I mean, it's a good profile for for a player. And then, bam! Now we have an even bigger hole to fill. I don't know what to say. Earlier in the transfer window, there were credible sources linking us and Galatasaray to Okai Yokushlu. You know, I didn't even realize that he's available on a free transfer from Celta Vigo, right? Um, yeah, West Brom got him. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's unfortunate. And like, what's unfortunate about that especially is that he could have been a kind of long-term replacement for Joseph, positionally, and he's a Turk, right? So that would have been a guy of value to get. Unfortunately, that's not happening. So where does that leave us? I have no idea. We need a central midfielder. Thank you, Amir Han. What a lovely parting gift. Um, on top of that, you know, maybe we need another winger still, supposedly. Maybe we need a central defender. I mean, if we're only playing with two back, obviously we don't. Maybe. I mean, still use upgrade talent wise. But yeah, I mean, just an absolute shame that things had to happen. So it totally soured everything. The whole preseason has been sullied. Our last match, which was supposed to be somewhat triumphant, you know, the, the homecoming. Very much sullied by it. That hang over the heads, like him coming on. Like we waste, like we just wasted 25, 30 minutes of, of playing time for someone when we could have been checking out to see if they have the ability to, to, to fit into that role. Just to give him some playing time, just in case he'd stick around. Surely it wasn't like to give the fans a final look. Now screw that. We're trying to compel him to stay, show him the fans loved him and all that. Didn't work, because he doesn't care. <laughs> So yeah, that's it. He's gone. We're in a mini crisis, a second mini crisis. The one was resolved, which is good news. Masuaku is in Istanbul, which is great. We need that. That's so important. That, that, that wing back role is one of the ones that needs to be, like that needed to be filled the most pressingly with the, the significance of those wingbacks to the system that Valeria Ismail is trying to input. 
So, that's a great pickup. 28 year old. Now, we need one more move. And of course, this does not add to the 16 million price tag of our off season. It's a loan with an option to buy, so we're pushing that responsibility out till next summer. Should he stick around? Should he be good enough to? Right, we're not even locked into that. If he's not, great move as always. So, right, we're only about six million in the hole. I think we could probably not splurge, but we, yeah, we need it. We need a defensive midfielder. We need a central midfielder. One of those two. Someone maybe who can perform both roles. So I don't know where that leaves us, but that's a need. <laughs> Thanks, Emmanuel. Thanks, kid. So, on that note, I think we're done. We're done here. Hopefully, we'll have a Masuaku episode. Uh, if not, either way, we'll be back very soon with some actual football to discuss. Uh, until then, we'll be back. Follow us on Twitter at Eagles underscore podcast. Follow myself at Sir underscore rights underscore a lot. And as always, let's go, Bashik Taz! Peace out, everybody. And yeah, follow us on Instagram, Black Eagles Podcast. One word. Who's that, everybody? Let's go, Pastor Tash. We've got a big football season ahead of us. Besiktas International hopes you enjoyed this program.